Hey everybody, I'm joined by Chris Coco, Senior Director of Aquatic Sustainability. Now you have a very interesting title there, Chris. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you do here at the aquarium? Well, Josh, how you doing? Thanks for having me today. Um, I've been here for a long time, as you know, at the aquarium, but I've, I've really recently assumed a new role, and it's really a reflection of the institution's desire to do more things with sustainable sourcing of animals and um, food items for our animals and conservation projects in general. So it's really exciting stuff coming up. Very cool. So, I, Chris, you and I actually, we've never worked together directly, but over the past six years, we've had some very, um, had some very interesting uh, kind of experiences that we've shared. One of them, if you remember, all the way back to, unbelievably, that was six years ago now, all the way back to 2016, and that crazy event that was uh, Hurricane Matthew down there in Florida. At the time, Georgia Aquarium was associated with a really beautiful animal facility right there on the beach. And our job was, uh, we were asked to go down and help out that facility, help out those animals in what was possibly at the time supposed to be a category four hurricane, which was making uh, landfall somewhere in that central Florida area near St. Augustine where this um, facility was. And, and I just remember thinking back on that experience of how we were the only vehicle going south on I-75 when all of 75 North was a, was a parking lot, if you remember that. And then getting there and, and kind of you know, getting that facility ready and, and experiencing everything that we did from, uh, you remember that lovely evening there in the shelter where 16 Georgia Aquarium employees were stuffed into a third grade classroom? Yeah, I'll tell you, there's no better way to bond with your coworkers than to be sent into the teeth of a deadly hurricane when everybody else is getting out of town. So yeah, that was a great time. In retrospect, it was a great time. Not so great at the moment, but yeah, the third grade classroom uh, lodging was just uh, awesome because all these grown men and women just jammed into there, um, surrounded by local folks who were, you know, genuinely worried about their, their, their homes and their lives and, and pets and everything. Um, so that was a bit of a, an eye-opener too. Remember, I remember when we were kind of picking our spots, Drew from the Dolphin Department was like, oh, I got this back corner. No one's going to be near, near me. Uh, you know, I'll be completely safe. He didn't realize that he picked the, <laughs> picked the closest spot to the one and only bathroom in the room. So all night long, he was being woken up by yeah. everybody that was That's going right. to the bathroom. That's right. Crazy experience. But we made it through. The animals made it through. Mm -hmm. And just a, a, another adventure that, uh, you know, folks don't normally get to hear about. It's not, um, you know, something that we can really tell our everyday guests as they come in here. So really cool experience that you and I got to go through. And then unbelievably, only eight months later, we went through Hurricane Irma. Yeah, it's bizarre. There was a cycle there of a number of storms in Florida. And uh, here we go again, right? So, uh, yeah, you just never know. I think it's kind of the, the you roll the dice a little bit when you have a seaside facility, right? There are pros and cons to it, and there's some some risk you've got to mitigate. And we, we worked it as best we could. And one thing I'll never forget about that experience uh, with you there too, Chris, I don't know if you remember or not, but the day that Irma made landfall was actually my 35th birthday. Mm -hmm. And you guys were very sweet as I came into the room and all that, you guys all said, happy birthday. And I'm pretty sure you or someone had gone down to the driveway and picked up a brick <laughs> That was just debris and wrapped it up and I got to open up a giant brick for my 35th birthday. I still have it, it's in my living room to this day. So that was a, a special memory there as I'm coming up on my, on my next birthday here in a couple weeks. But yeah, I'll never forget my 35th and getting that brick in the middle of a land falling hurricane. Well, some of the most unexpected gifts are the most memorable ones, right? So yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Pretty cool, so awesome. So with, with, with all that being said, I've, I've known you for several years and stuff, but. Uh, never really had the chance to to kind of sit down like we are now to be able to really kind of dig in to 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 what you do here and kind of explain to some folks uh, kind of some of the the ins and outs of of what it takes to keep the uh, uh, aquarium sustainable and things like that as well as talk about um, some not really controversial topics but some really kind of hot button conservation topics such as like animal confiscation and animal trafficking things like that so um, if you could could you just kind of I, I explain just a little bit of like what an animal confiscation is and how we as a as a facility are able to assist in, uh, in in things like that. Sure, sure. Of course, our location near the world's busiest airport is um, inevitably going to result in some animals that come through uh, via air cargo shipments that uh, are either lost in transit, don't make a flight connection or something like that, or have the incorrect paperwork either um, inadvertently by the shipper or, or otherwise. And from time to time, some of those animals are, are set aside by Fish and Wildlife Service or other agencies, typically Fish and Wildlife Service, and then they need a home, right? So they call us, and I think it really is about the partnership we have with the federal agencies and the state agencies 
and at the airport, if it's, a, if it's um, an import from a foreign nation, um, it's typically the Fish and Wildlife Service. But we've gotten calls from Georgia DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, and other agencies. But uh, it's really about um, working and supporting what the, these agencies are doing, one, to protect wildlife, and two, to make sure that when particular specimens find themselves without a home, for whatever reason, uh, that they can call us and we'll, we'll rehome those animals. And there's been a number of examples, many examples over the years, and it, it sort of ebbs and flows depending upon the season, the time of the year. Um, for example, we see a lot of corals come through the system, and you know, 99 point something percent of, of those are, are shipped in legally, but occasionally they're either misnamed or the paperwork's missing or, or whatever. Um, and then we will end up with a box of corals that we will need to home here or uh, move over to our colleagues' institutions elsewhere. So it just depends on the situation. That's very interesting that you bring them up first because when people, I think, think of confiscated or, or trafficked animals, most likely you're probably going to think about some type of mammal or um, you know, a reptile, things like that. Mm -hmm. But coral is a very interesting uh, species to, to, to actually confiscate. So it's, it's cool that we can um, you know, have the ability to uh, to be able to accommodate and, and find a home and be able to, to grow that coral so it, it uh, gets a chance to, to continue to grow and also tell people its story about how it was confiscated. So you mentioned coral there. What are some of the other um, species that you can think of that, uh, that we've been asked to, to give a forever home to or assist in finding their forever home over the years? Well, there's a number of fish species that have come through the, the, um, the pipeline over the years, um, most notably, and I think what uh, many of our guests have seen are Upstairs in our, our touch tank, we have a number of uh, South American stingrays that uh, were illegally imported into the States and then they were, they were found, you know, transiting through Atlanta's airport and uh, those ended up with us. And um, we decided to keep them here as exhibit animals, tell a little story about wildlife trafficking and, and the, you know, the, the risk that it poses to a lot of species around the globe. Uh, and we put them on display and turned them into a, a touch animals. So not only do our guests have an interaction opportunity to, to you know, have that you know, emotional connection by a two-finger touch on a stingray, uh, we also tell a story about uh, global wildlife trafficking and the risks it poses to, to wildlife. So as guests are walking through the building, is there, are there any other species that kind of have a similar story to the stingrays, or are they the only ones that are actually on display? Well, they're the most prominent ones. We have some corals in our, our Pacific Barrier Reef exhibit that, that are products or the result, I should say, of, of uh, confiscations, but uh, they're hard to really pick out at any given moment, if, especially for a layperson. And it's more of an ecosystem presentation there versus the, the stingray presentation, which is more about a touch interaction. So a little more obscure when you see them on display. And we've had other animals come and go through the years. Uh, we've had some uh, Thai catfish that were confiscated. Um, and they grow quite large. Um, there are a, a large uh, food fish in Southeast Asia, uh, but they're mostly extinct in their wild range. So what we see in, in culture, in food culture in Asia, is not necessarily the, the it's the same species, but they're domesticated versions of them. Um, we've had some of those recently, and we were able to find a, a new home for them elsewhere. But um, So there's examples that are kind of varied and um, different animals, different situations, and so forth. But um, I think the, the stingrays are the most prominent versions of, of those on display right, right now. And not to take a dark turn, but I'm pretty sure I think I know what the answer is going to be. If we weren't able to, to assist in other facilities like us, other accredited facilities aren't able to assist, the alternative probably isn't a good one, is it? Well, we try to avoid um, you know, the, the, the dog shelter um, template here. We, we've held animals for many years that we could not find homes for. And we'll continue to do that uh, unless there's a, an animal welfare or well-being problem that we've, we've run into with, with continuing to, to hold these animals. We will we'll, we'll make that commitment to, to footprint and to labor to keep them alive and, and well. So that's, that's our mission is to provide good welfare to, to animals. So um, there are very, very few examples that I can recall in my 30-year career where we've had to euthanize uh, confiscated animals due to a lack of a home. Good. Well, yeah, it's, it's very important. I'm really glad that we have the space, the ability, and the people that have the uh, expertise as well as the, you know, the passion to care for these, these animals. Um, that's very, very cool. So uh, with your title being Aquatic Sustainability, what exactly is the uh, sustainability aspect of it? Is it um, having to do with the, the, the food sources? Does it have to do with our actual population? Can you just go a little bit more into what aquatic sustainability actually is and, and why it's important. Sure, well, it's really both what you mentioned, those both areas. Uh, we have a lot of marine mammals here, as you know really well, 
that eat a lot of food. And so you know, that food comes from the seafood industry, typically. And as we uh, see changes in, in ocean temperatures and availability of, of food that may shift because animals are moving around and, and utilizing different areas of, of the world because their habitat's changing, uh, we're seeing some challenges with supply. Uh, also, the reality is we should probably be um, taking our, our game to a higher level by creating the food that we feed our own living collection. And whether it's through aquaculture or through um, uh, artificial type pelleted food or, or gel uh, foods of some sort, um, we, we need to invest our, our resources in doing that. Uh, depressurize, take from the wild and create a, a diet item that's really healthy and, and consistently so for our living collections. So that's the food sustainability part of it. We're looking at uh, partnering up with uh, universities and private entities to, to grow our own food uh, for our living collection. On the specimen side of it, uh, the living, the, the display specimen side of it, you know, aquaculture has really advanced in the last 30 to 40 years. And we've, we've moved um, beyond, say, goldfish and catfish to high-end marine ornamentals now. And there are a number of small firms that have become larger, of course, over time that have cracked the code um, with university research partners, I should add. Um, on spawning and, and rearing out marine ornamentals. So we really need to depressurize our, um, our desire to, to utilize wild specimens and get more into domestic aquaculturing of those specimens, uh, demonstrate the, you know, the, the positives of such a thing, and, and, and meet our conservation goals as an institution. So we're really working hard to create uh, an ornamental marine fish aquaculture program here. That's very cool. Now you mentioned you know, uh, there are some organizations that have been uh, around for 30, 40 years that are, that are getting into this now. Uh, Georgia Aquarium has been around for, for quite some time, and I believe you were here in the very, very beginning, correct? Yeah, I was hired in uh, early 2004, right? So it, it's been a long, um, interesting adventure. Uh, quite a journey since uh, landing here and working at an old warehouse before the aquarium was even built. Um, we, we have a second and third generation off-site facility now and we're looking to do more there. But uh, yeah, when you look at the gift that Bernie Marcus uh, bestowed upon us, uh, his philanthropy is incredible, um, and what we've been able to do with it over these 17, 18 years, it's, it's been uh, just amazing and, and for me to be part of that experience. So uh, my, my role is changing from when we first arrived, everybody was about bringing animals to Atlanta, right? Whether they were local animals from 30 miles away or 3,000 or, or more miles away. Um, and now we're getting more into this, um, creating our own living collection through um, propagation, artificial propagation or what have you. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's been quite a ride. I can imagine. I mean, you, you mentioned it there. I'm going to use your own segue against you right now. You just said, you know, traveling 3,000 miles, if not further. You were a part of, uh, the, of the whale sharks coming to Atlanta, right? Yeah, we did several uh, transports of whale sharks from Taiwan to Atlanta, and I was on a couple of those, those transports and spent quite a bit of time in Taiwan working with our, our partners there. Um, it's an interesting place, Taiwan. They've um, got quite a, a, an ocean resource. And, and the nice thing about whale sharks uh, that came from Taiwan to here is they were redirected from uh, the market. So you know, years ago, it was legal to you know, collect those animals and send them to market, um, the local seafood market. Uh, now that's no longer legal there which is great. And the nice thing about our whale sharks here is that tens of millions of people have seen them, um, perhaps who would never get to see whale sharks anywhere else. Um, we also have to remember we're an inland facility and, and folks can't necessarily do a, a whale watching tour or a scuba diving trip or those sorts of things. They put them closer to animals that we have here, whether they're whale sharks, beluga whales, or other things. Um, so yeah, they've, uh, they've been great ambassadors, the whale sharks have, for all these years. That's very cool. I mean, and what you said is very true. I mean, uh, this is the first and only place I've ever seen a whale shark. And you know that I'm a huge shark enthusiast mm -hmm. and I love diving and things like that. Uh, but being able to see these animals every single day, um, it still doesn't get old. It, 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 is, it, is it still, is it, does it still have that little romanticism to you as well when you see these oh, guys? That, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. And, and as we're talking here and I see a whale shark go out of you know, my peripheral vision, I, it's like, wow, it's a big animal, you know? And, yeah. uh, we put a lot of resources and effort here um, into caring for these animals, and uh, we, we, we've had them on display continuously for all these years, and we feel that in the next 30 years or more, we're gonna have whale sharks here. It's gonna be awesome. So when you were, when you were on that original transport, you know, Taiwan to Atlanta, that's, 
that's halfway around the entire earth. Was there a moment in, during that where you're just like, wow, you know, that there had to have been something with like that little just, poof, this is very unique. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of wow moments and they're a little bit intimidating. When you first see a whale shark, um, you know, swimming around in a sea pen, temporary holding in a sea pen, and then you move to a transport day where we're moving the animal out with cranes onto a boat and you go to a harbor and then you go to a truck that takes the animal to the airport, two animals at a time actually. Um, uh, we're on a small uh, coastal city in Taiwan on the east side and they have a very short runway. So we had to charter a, a short runway heavy lift cargo plan to get us from the smaller city and central coast up to Taipei where we would connect with the 747 to go across the ocean. And so the, um, the particular cargo plane that we had was very old, very old. There was a lot of duct tape in that fuselage. And um, it was something I was very worried about getting off the ground because our load was pretty heavy. You look at 25,000 pounds per, per box times two boxes uh, and the short runway that ends with a chain link fence and the ocean is next. So um, that was a, a wow moment for me as we we're kind of slow speed, it felt like slow speed going down the, the runway to get off the ground there. I don't think that chain link fence was gonna really do much at the end, no, was it? You no, know? it just let you know that it was the end. <laughs> right. So, that's but, crazy, I mean, that, and that's a, a very, yeah, that's a incredible story. It almost has like that kind of uh, Indiana Jones-esque kind of vibe to it, where you just kind of picture like that red line just moving up the coast of Taiwan to get to mm -hmm. the new airport and then flying all the way across the ocean and then Boom, all of a sudden, for the first time in history, there's whale sharks in Atlanta and here in the United States. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty milestone achievement. It's got to be pretty cool to be a part of. Yeah, it, great memories, and uh, the, the folks were just so um, unified in, in our, our whole effort to make it happen, whether it's our partners, our own employees, and uh, outside um, colleagues as, as helpers. So uh, it really was a great time in, in the career. So um, and the other thing about it is we, we put whale sharks on airplanes when no one else had done that before. And it was just an amazing uh, effort. And it all came together and was completely successful each time. So. so Chris, with all that being said, and all these amazing experiences that you've had uh, over your very long and, and distinguished career, what's your best advice to the next Chris Coco, to the next senior director of aquatic sustainability, or the next uh, whale shark caretaker, the next uh, fish and invertebrates team member, What's some advice or you know, anything you can give to the next generation of, of, uh, of our stewards of the earth here? Well, I'm not sure you want, uh, I want anyone to be the next Chris Coco, but as far as um, um, an aquarium professional or a zoological professional, whether it's terrestrial animals or whatever it happens to be, uh, as, as a young person, I would encourage kids to get out. Get outside, poke around the woods and the creek beds and the shorelines and the tide pools and and see what inspires you. If, if wildlife and the sense of discovery inspires you, then um, take that to the next level. Maybe become a hobbyist and put a little fish tank up in your, in your house or in your basement and obviously coordinate that with your parents um, and, and mess around with other animals and just get to learn what makes them tick. And, and if you continue to be inspired and amazed and intrigued by that sort of activity, then you might, you might, might already be hooked, right? So um, that's what I did, and that's what really turned me on about animals. For me, as a kid, it was all about reptiles, and then I moved into fish a little bit later. Um, and you've, you've got to really do well in school with science and math. I mean, it's really about the STEM, um, STEM core, I think, and, um, and, and try, if you can, to get scuba certified and get in the water and, and see if uh, immersion into the environment is also um, inspiring to you. Uh, those sorts of things, um, internships and um, just making sure you make you build relationships in, in school and beyond um, and they, that's how it gets you down the road in any any career path but as long as you feel inspired and excited by wildlife that's a good start very cool and after your long career here what what still inspires you what's next for Chris Coco well what inspires me today especially here at Georgia Aquarium is our ability to take what we do to another level another more sophisticated level that's going to set us up for the next 50 years I hope it's a long time frame, but it really goes pretty quick. You know, for me, 18 years has just gone by in the blink of an eye, right? Um, so I, I want to, I hope, set in motion some uh, foundational changes to how we operate with uh, using sustainability as a core value. Um, it's, it should be something we aspire to all the time, and I'm looking forward to setting up programs that, that help, well, with all of our partners here, of course, 
to get us uh, moving on that road. Very cool. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. One last question. I'm going to put you on the spot right here and now. If someone sees you walking around the aquarium, just enjoying, you know, your walk, where's where's your first stop? Where's some place that you're just always going to go when you're when you're here in the building? Uh, I'm probably looking at some of the planted tanks in the River Scout Gallery. Yeah, some of the uh, smaller vignette presentations that have live plants, fish, you know, sort of the whole eco slice of an ecosystem, right? So um, it's. It's easy to say the Ocean Voyager big reveal window in the theater section, but um, I think for me, zeroing in on the smaller, um, less obvious aspects of living creatures and plants, that's what turns me on a lot. Very cool. And it's, it's interesting you say that too, because there are the, the, the smaller habitats, but yet the story that they're telling by having the plants and animals in there is actually a, telling a much bigger story because it's looking at the bigger picture of everything that's connected to to these animals and to these plants and things like that. That's right, that's right. It's a, it's a sophisticated uh, world out there, right? And those habitats and those ecosystems need to stay intact. Very cool. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. It's been great talking to you, yeah, buddy. Appreciate it, Josh, thank you.